going live on Facebook and all those places. So hopefully, uh, if you want to submit a question here on Instagram, you want to give us a question. Hello, welcome back to our Q and A. Uh, today we're talking uh, music. We're talking music marketing. We're talking lots of fun things. So uh, I'm glad you could be here today. So thanks for tuning in. Please uh, feel free to drop in some questions. Uh, drop in the questions on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, wherever you like. Uh, I'm going to see there's a couple questions that came in this week, so we'll get, jump on with those. And uh, we'll just see how it goes, see, see where things take us this week. So uh, thanks for being here. I'm excited that uh, this week got some new swag for Outside of Music, uh, some new hats. If you go to my story, you can see those, so uh, you can check those out. Um, and the other thing that's exciting that's coming up is August 10th through August uh, 14th. That's a Monday through Friday, uh, the week before school starts for us uh, at UNT. But we're gonna, I'm going to be hosting a deep dive into music marketing. It's called the Music Marketing Roadmap. And we're going to take a week, an, an hour or two every day to kind of delve into different topics. So if you go to musicmarketingroadmap.com, you can check those out. Uh, the Music Marketing Roadmap is going to show you how to build your brand and build your audience and it's going to show you how to monetize uh, your online presence and a whole bunch of other things uh, and it's free it's free and uh, it's a chance for me to kind of clarify my ideas about <clears throat> the topics and to discuss with you all and find out you know what are the things that people are wondering about what are the things that people are struggling with so all of those things are things we're going to kind of jump into uh, next month August 10th through 14th so if you want to check that out musicmarketingroadmap.com. You can check those out. Uh, we'll, be, we'll be over there. So uh, without further ado, I want to jump into some questions. Uh, so if you do have questions, feel free to drop them in on Facebook, drop them in on Instagram. I have one from Instagram, so we'll start there and then we'll see where things lead us today. So this is from somebody named I Play Jazz with a lot of G, with a lot of Z's says, what's a good way to assess your current skills or ability on the trombone? Oh, well, this is a great question and one that uh, I suppose there's a few different answers for. Um, the first one is to record yourself. So if you, when you record yourself, you're able to listen back and really assess if you're doing what you think you're doing. Oftentimes, you know, we're not doing exactly what we think we're doing, either for the better or the worse. Um, but we really have a difficult time as people at least I do, and I think most other people do, have a difficult time actually being able to um, decide and decipher what's happening in real time. Uh, real time, deciding if it was good or bad is never usually the way to go. You want to record yourself and listen back. I mean, if you can do it on your phone. You can get a Zoom. I use, uh, I have my Zoom right here. I use um, this Zoom H4n right here, this thing. Uh, I use that and that works great. I use just my phone. I use all the sort of different things. I see your question here. What? Uh, guess what, Dewa? Says, so what? Um, use the tools, use your phone, record, listen back and see if you're doing what you think you're doing. Also, you have to assess, uh, you have to find people, people that you trust and ask their opinion. So a teacher or a mentor or other players that you like, you know, somebody that'll give you the real truth. Uh, about what are the things you're doing well and what are the things that you're not doing well. Um, I play jazz. You know, if you want to send me something, send me something. You know, I'll see if I can take a listen and send it back to you. Um, so that's one great way you can do that. That's one great way you can assess yourself, see where you're at, and, and go from there. So um, there's that way. And then uh, from there, I guess... The ability thing, I mean, I think you can kind of measure that yourself by saying, like, am I able to play the technical things I want to be able to play? Am I getting better at them? Like, can I execute these things? Am I working on these things? You know, the thing about trombone or any other instrument and that practice of trying to get better and better each and every week, you know, the thing is that you have to um, commit to the long term. What's up, Maxwell? Uh, I see you there. Uh, you have to commit to the long term and trying to get better and better a little bit at a time each day. It's so small on that day to day that like you never you don't even know necessarily that you're getting better until you record yourself. And then six months later, you might see a recording of yourself and be like, man, I really have gotten better. So that's why it's important to document. That's why 
And this ties in directly to something that I talk about a lot with our artists and outside of music and with artists in general. And sometimes people have a hard time deciding, quote unquote, they're ready for a project or ready to make an album. But um, if you don't, how are you ever going to document your process? How are you ever going to document where you stood, your musical ideas, your uh, musical personality? You know, we I love going back and li listening to like early JJ and then mid career JJ, late career JJ Johnson, and really seeing how has he changed? How has he stayed the same? And if you aren't doing that yourself, if you don't document the beginning of the journey, how will somebody able to be able to trace you back or even you just to trace you back and see how you've developed over time? So I just as much as it's like a commercial um, enterprise to make a recording and release it to the world and try to get people to review it and get reviews to get gigs and all this whole process. Um, I just I think it's essential to have it as a document for yourself of what you're doing and what's you know where you're headed and what you're up to musically your compositions it forces you to like put a timeline on things and give you like a goal an aim like ah, i have this session i'm going to record 10 original tunes i got to write them it's going to be about this it's going to be this um uh instrumentation so you know for me it's really really important to like set those goals and to document this stuff over time because if not it's just going to disappear. And before you know it, you'll be 30, 40, 50 and not done anything. And then the pressure mounts each time. Like you haven't gotten started. You haven't gotten started. You haven't gotten started. Now it's your first record. And you're like, oh, my God, now it has to be perfect because I've waited so long. It's like, no, just get some stuff going because that first time is always going to be the hardest. And um, so, you know, that ties back to the trombone question in that, you know, you have to try to just get better. You have to document. You have to commit to it over the long term. And... Uh, and yeah, that's what I think about that. So I play jazz. I hope that answers your question. I hope you can uh, get yourself your phone out and just start to record yourself and to talk about, or talk about, and to listen to the things that your teachers are telling you. You know, find somebody you can trust, like I said, that'll give you direct feedback. And and, and that's it really is what it is. So let's see. Let's see what other questions have come in. Oh, a couple spam questions. Very good. We'll leave those be. We'll just leave this up there for now. But if you're watching live, please drop in some questions, uh, whatever you're thinking about, whatever you're wondering about. <clears throat> um, this week, excuse me, I'm just going to grab some coffee. We've got a little lull. It's a nice, chill Friday. <sighs> yes. But um, so I want to just kind of talk to you about some things that are on, on my mind, if nobody has any particular questions. Um, I'm really thinking about this music marketing roadmap thing. You know, I talked about it a minute before, but thinking about, you know, the most effective ways to be able to grow your your brand and your audience and marketing. And, uh, you know, I think that even though we're all in this difficult time and, uh, you know, listen to some people talking yesterday on a podcast about when and if things were going to come back in terms of live music performance and people were talking about maybe, maybe Q2 2021, you know, maybe. And so, you know, jazz stuff will probably come back a little bit before that. But they were talking about like big concert tours and stuff like that. So, you know, looking forward to like we got almost a whole year still, uh, nine months at least before it really starts to roll. And um, just think about, yeah, we got to take advantage of this time to build your audience. I reread this morning a great article. If you've never read this before, I just just reread it this morning by um, a technologist named Kevin Kelly. Excuse me. Kevin Kelly, A Thousand True Fans, that's the name of it. I see there's a question in, on Instagram. I'll get gr grab it in just a second here. Um, but his name's Kevin Kelly, and he wrote uh, this article about A Thousand True Fans. And A Thousand True Fans, like the idea is, you know, you don't need to be the biggest star to everyone. You just need to be important to 100 people, or 1,000 people, rather. And the price point, at, like if they, if they can make, each of those people can make you $100 a year, you can have a thousand great fans that you're really able to stay in touch with and interact with and uh, make a hundred bucks from each one of them. And you've made a hundred thousand dollars in that year, which is a great career for most musicians. So um, that's what I'm, I'm focused on building those thousand true fans. And so I appreciate you guys being here. And uh, I'm trying to do that for our artists and our clients at Outside of Music as well. So if you're a musician and you're watching this and you're thinking about how you can take advantage of this time to build your audience and to build, you know, we're taking on clients right now uh, to try to help them with that. So uh, get in touch, send me a message. But we got another question. 
44, 440 hertz or 442 hertz on trombone Gregory Wong? 440, I think. Well, actually, I mean, Gregory, I see this confusing. We pull up your question and bring this guy back down. That's an interesting question because he's asking, um, there's different systems of tuning for different orchestras. I don't know that it's really either. I think trombone kind of can operate in just tuning, actually. Um, so an A isn't going to be an A, you know? And it could be a 440 or 442, but really uh, the trombone says it plays with a slide, right? You can, you can actually play with just tuning and you can play with the overtone series. This is super nerdy and super... <laughs> But uh, if you're a trombone player and you're watching, if you just try this, um, you'll know, you can do this, get this, do this. So you get one person playing a low B flat, one person playing a D above the staff, so it's a 10th, right? Get that perfectly in tune. Now have that person, the, the person playing the lower note go to a G. Now you're playing a perfect fifth, and notice that it doesn't sound quite as resonant, it doesn't quite sound quite the same. Why? Because now you're in two different positions, right? You have G, one person playing G in fourth, and the other person playing D in first, and so it's resonating on different enharmonic series. So now move the D to fourth position so you're both in the same enharmonic series and see how that feels. It's super, super weird and super interesting. Um, I just wanted you to try because then you can start to be like, you know, sometimes when I'm playing in an ensemble, um, I have to test out different positions um, for different notes because, like here's a great example, a high B flat above the staff, you know, whether to play it in first or third, like you wouldn't necessarily play it in third that often, but sometimes when you're playing, it reminded me of this because there's a new uh, video, a new album out today by Glenn, Z Glenn Zaleski, who's a great pianist. And he um, wrote this tune called Subterfuge and recorded it with Lucas Pino's Nonet uh, back in February. And um, we did recorded it and there's some positions, some notes that are kind of, like oh, difficult to tune so i ended up playing a lot of stuff in alternate positions just to have more flexibility with moving the slide more flexibility with being able to adjust and to play uh like adjust more with just tuning you know because he wasn't playing at all you know the piano wasn't doesn't play for like the first half of the tune so at any rate so you got to think about on trombone like what an harmonic series i'm on like sometimes it's too loud sometimes it's too resonant or not resonant enough that pitch inside of the voicing um, I know that's like listening at a pretty deep level, but to me, that's something that I've always tried to level up over time is um, that ability to listen deeply, listen really, really deeply and really try to focus in on that. So yeah, trombone, just tuning. So it's 440 or 40 to 442. I'm going to go to a question from Facebook here from Count J. Hey, Count J, thanks for being here again. I know... Uh, I know uh, you're a frequent contributor, so I appreciate you being here. Thanks, welcome back. Um, so he asked about my trombone. You play King trombone, do you have any trombones? I'm thinking other trombones, he means. Uh, why King? Thanks. Uh, so this is my trombone, it's right here. Um, it looks a little beat up. Why? Mostly because I have really kind of acidic uh, body chemistry and I play a lot also, touch my trombone a lot. Um, it's a King 3B plus, so it's a 525 bore. Um, so it's medium size. It's because uh, my sound concept has changed. You know, I'm not a person that likes to kind of have a laser beam kind of tone. I kind of want it to be a little more round. Uh, so I wanted to move towards something. A 547 seems like maybe a little bit too big. Um, I tried a Shires for a while. I played an Edwards before that. Um, the Edwards had the, the brushed finish on it, and I just ended up not really connecting to it after a while. Um, so uh, I moved away from that. I wanted that bigger sound, you know, more, maybe not quite slide Hampton going all the way to like straight bass trombone. You know, that's pretty extreme. But uh, for me, I went to the 525. Why King? Um, you know, the, I like the Kings because they tend to have a little bit more personality than some other brands, you know, that are like more maybe factory made, but they're also not super like customizable and the fact it's like i'm not a person that can really tell the difference like i can tell the difference between like you know a rose brass or yellow brass this and like a little weight here and there like i just kind of want a trombone and um I, and i like king because you know it has kind of like a certain iconic sound and they the bells are thin enough that you can make them ring even though they're um you know 
sturdy. I mean, the certain bells are just super thick. Like the Edwards one was, it just felt thick and heavy to me after a while of playing it. And it was just like too much effort to play. Not that they're not great horns because they are good horns, but it just wasn't what I wanted to do anymore, how much effort it took to play. So I uh, made a switch. Uh, and that was in 2014, I think now. So it was like six years ago. Uh, I, you know, I think I'm still kind of searching, you know, if they would make a, what I'd really like if they did some kind of 525 dual bore with um, maybe 547 over here. That's what Steve Ture plays. Um, I think that's what he plays, 525, 547, something like that. But he plays a Yamaha, but that's not a commercially available model. Um, but, you know, if I could get a little bit bigger on this um, second tube, I like the small shank. I don't want to go to a large shank. But if I could get a bigger large tube and then maybe a half inch bigger on the bell or eight, an eight inch bell, these are seven and three quarters, I think. Um, and we've talked talk to them about getting the, you know, screw off bell too. So um, I don't know, uh, but that's why I play King. I, I can get a lot of colors out of it, kind of switch it up, switch it up, man. And uh, I can play lead on the horn. I can play second, third, I could play solo. I can play plunger. I can play, you know, whatever. It has a pretty wide range. I'm not a person that, I'm not a like right tool for the job kind of person. I want one tool that's going to do all the jobs. Uh, and I think that's just personal preference, really. You know, you can't, um, you can't do both. You can't do both at the same time. So, uh, you know, that's all. That's it. So that's why uh, if, you, if you're listening to this, Count J now, and uh, if you could tell them that you want them to make more of these the 3B plus trombones, that would be great. And I'm trying to get the marketing team and everyone to start pushing this horn more because I think there's a market for people that want a good big sound that don't want to like only play lead and have a super laser focused sound. Uh, so yeah, that's anyway. Get in touch with them. Tell them I sent you, and uh, we'll we'll go from there. If we could get them to make it with a little bit bigger bell, a screw off bell, and uh, maybe maybe have a dual bore option, 525, 547, or maybe f even smaller, like something custom, something weird, you know. 525, 535, 537, you know, five, something like that, just to give it a little bit more heft. Um, yeah. Anyway, so thanks for the question, Count Jay. I'm going to move on. There's a couple more questions over on Facebook. Uh, I'm going to jump to this one from David Mayrat. And, and DJ, I see your question here. Uh, all right, so David is asking about low register tonguing. Yeah, man, it's my pleasure. I'm happy to do it. I enjoy making the content. If you didn't know right now, I've got new videos every single day on YouTube this month, July 2020. Um, calling it Jazz Ramon Christmas in July. Um, you can go and find a link to sign up and get them in your email every single day. Or you can just go to YouTube, subscribe to my YouTube channel, and hit the little bell thing, and it'll tell you every day when there's a new video. So there's new stuff coming out every day on that. If you're looking for stuff to practice, um, covering all sorts of mostly jazz vocabulary stuff. Uh, but his question is about making it easy to tongue in the low register. So um, for me, tonguing in the low register is still hard, but number one is just doing stuff like ta 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 consistently and down into the lower register. So I just do it. That kind of thing. And then go down. A, A flat, G, F sharp, F, E natural, right? Um, let's see. I don't know if you'll be able to see it. If I hold up to music, you probably won't be able to see it. But um, in my warm up book, Get ready. You can find it on YouTube for free. Uh, there's a, one called Wake Up, an exercise called Wake Up, and it's just like getting the tongue moving, right? So you go, you just have to tongue a lot in the lower register, number one. Number two um, is make sure you got the right vowel sound. Toe, like ta ta to 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 and then making sure your tongue isn't getting in the way. Uh, so a lot of time I find what happens is the tongue, you go to, the mouth opens and your tongue ends up going down into the middle between your teeth, like here, it goes fa 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 and your, your jaw kind of goes fa 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 and we don't necessarily want that. We want the tongue to kind of stay in the same place. So I like to think about putting the tongue at the where your gums and your teeth meet 
on the top of your mouth, da, 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 right up there somewhere, rather than between the teeth, because the, between the teeth gets you that fuzz and it gets you the kind of thing, which is no good really. Um, so I recommend ta 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 ti ta to 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 and you got to make sure that that tongue is staying up and out of the way. Then the third thing I'll tell you about low register tonguing is if you can't do um, what do we call breath attacks in the low register, then you have almost no chance of being able to do the tonguing too. So I try to do like a kind of tongue, uh, a, a kind of breath attack, not a tongue, you know, like, and I just go like five, four, three, two, one. With four on each one, I go. You know, down in half steps, um, and uh, yeah, with the breath attack, get the breath attacks down low, add a little bit of tongue, and then you should have more clarity there. Uh, David says he's following. Oh, nice! He's following our jazz for more Christmas in July, and he's working. Amazing. Cool. Well, so David, hopefully some of those low register things will help you. I think, you know, a lot of times we just kind of ignore the low register, but the more the more you put in the time day after day, you know, I think you'll you'll be good. It'll work itself out over time. Force yourself to play in that low register because it's the uncomfortable. And and yeah, I mean you'll be you'll you'll make it happen, I'm sure. So yeah, make just just think about that syllable where the tongue is placed. And then just forcing yourself to do it. Those, those couple exercises I just gave you should uh, clean it up over the next six months or something like that. You gotta, you gotta be, you know, realistic with the timeline too. It's gonna take six months, not six days, you know, before it feels really comfortable. And it's still uncomfortable for me, you know. I'm still working on it. If I ignore it, you know, if I ignore the low register, it's hard for me to tongue down there as well. So don't, don't worry. What's happening, Diego? I haven't. Instagram is real light on the questions today. So uh, Instagram, drop in some questions. It's all on all the actions on Facebook today, which is cool, but I, come on. Uh, all right, so another question from DJ Rice, great uh, trombonist, studied doing his master's up at uh, MSU. Uh, one of my former students at UNT. So speaking of slide, I've been trying to find recordings of slide where he's in a small group setting. Play tunes that I've had a kind of a hard time. What albums of his? What albums of his do you recommend for small group? Well, I like Day in Copenhagen. Uh, you probably know that one. I like uh, uh, Melo D is another one. He's playing small group. I like, uh, what is that one? It's a Japanese release. I, he's walking in uh, Riverside Park on the cover. I can see it in my mind. Playing small group tunes is a Japanese re-release. It's got um, Last Minute Blues on it, but it's a different version than the one on Melody. Um, I can't think of. I can't think of. There's a. Those are a few. Um, I'd have to pull up my Spotify and find some more. There's like Explosion. There's all the octet stuff, which he does play tunes on. But you know, I guess you're looking for just like super straightforward small group stuff. Um, yeah, the octet stuff is still blowing, you know. I mean, I like I like his blowing on the World of Trombone stuff, too. Um, yeah, I mean, he's got a lot of stuff out there. But um, I guess maybe just as like a quartet, maybe there's not quite as many things. Uh, but I like that. Exodus is another record of his, uh, which, which is him um, with like a, you know, like a sextet or something. And he plays Confirmation on there. That's one that I send a lot of students to transcribe. That's a good solo on confirmation if you're trying to find something to transcribe. Um, yeah, so there's some. Slide Hampton is killing, super killing. Uh, sometimes underrated for whatever reason. He's not, he wasn't as famous, I guess, as JJ maybe, but you know, Slide's still with us, you know, and still writing and doing stuff with the Dizzy Gillespie big band and all kinds of things. <laughs> Uh, here's a question, Mandy J. There are so few videos out there on when to use natural slurs or legato tongue. Is there something I'm missing? Can you explain an easy way to remember and some ways to practice this? Yes, Mandy. Uh, I never use only uh, only natural slurs. Never. 
because that mean, then they're all of a sudden it's going to stick out like a sore thumb, uh, especially in jazz articulation when you go like just go da 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 in the case of doing a very fast turn or something, it might be da 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 and just using the, the natural slur a little bit. But generally, I try to articulate every single note. Uh, so if you do that, um, you will have no problem. I just it becomes a crutch, and you can hear it. If somebody goes da 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 da, and they go ah, and they go, I'm thinking like C to D in a B flat major scale. Da, 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 and they just it just sounds different than if you slur from B flat to C, right? Or if you slur from E flat to F or F to G. So if you tongue every single note with that legato tongue, they'll all be the same and then you don't have to worry about it. And then if you then you can use that quote unquote against the grain thing when it's when it's like an effect rather than anything else. So Mandy, start tonguing every single note with your legato tongue. And that and that, that's what I tell my students all the time. Tongue every single note. Don't use the natural slur, you know, there's so, I just, I feel like there's so much variability, like you could miss, <laughs> you you know, what's up Hussein, I see you here, uh, thanks for joining. Um, yeah, that's the easiest way, that's, that, may, that might be what you're missing, is that somebody told you to use the natural slur once, and uh, if you actually just tongued every note, it would be way easier, uh, because you're trying to, you're trying to like when you use the natural slur, you're trying to like aim and guess and go like ah uh, like up to a note. But if you go da di, you can still connect it just as easily. But uh, with just a little bit, a tiny little bit of tongue, then if you just go ah uh, and it goes oh, uh, you know what I'm saying, right? Uh, you've, we've all had that moment where you try to use that um, that that natural quote unquote slur. Uh, I just think it's cheating. I just think tongue every single note. You know, Steve Trey beat that into my head and it changed the way that I played. Uh, it's like, no, just tongue every single note and then it'll be clean if you have clean tonguing. So uh, long answer to a short, uh, long explanation to a short answer, Mandy. So I hope that um, helps you. Uh, so that's that's how you practice it. She says, uh, how do you how do you remember and how do you practice it? You practice it by just doing it tongue every single note. Um, even when you're doing triplets, like I was working with a student this last week on um, confirmation, and it was clean except for every single turn. Every time he had a turn, it would you would try to use the natural break, and it was super. It becomes it becomes like me talking like this, and then it's like you can't understand what they're saying. So uh, just tongue all the notes. Uh, I don't mean to be abrasive sounding when I say that, but uh, it's uh, sometimes sometimes it's just as simple as that. It's harder to do that, but um, we're cheating. So uh, so okay, Count J asking people to drop a question. Uh, anyway, man, great questions from and insightful questions from Facebook today. Thanks to everyone for being here. Uh, <clears throat> Nirbin, hi Nirbin, who am I? My name is Nick Finzer, I'm a jazz trombonist and composer, educator, entrepreneur, and we're doing a Q&A today. Every Friday at this time, <clears throat> every Friday at this time, uh, we'll just put up a blank question here. If, if on Instagram you want to drop something in. <laughs> oh boy, David, David, you're hitting on some uh, touchy topics here. I'm gonna get in trouble. I'm gonna, uh, okay, so if I may, he says, if I may, what what about jazz vibrato? Kind of little lip squeeze, air pushes, moving jaws. I've run about, out of ideas. Uh, how do I find the right timing and pace? So I listen to vocalists like Ella Fitzgerald, Sarah Vaughan, Nat King Cole, Frank Sinatra, um, for vibrato ideas, vibrato inspiration. Uh, I think JJ and Curtis do this perfectly, especially on ballads, is that if you listen, the, the vibrato speed is natural and it speeds up at the end of the note. It's slow to fast, slow to fast. And no offense uh, to anyone that likes it, but I really am not a fan of sly vibrato. I think it sounds obnoxious. Um, so I don't 
like to do it. It has its place when you're doing certain stylistic things. If you're playing Tommy Dorsey, if you're playing like a shout band, if you're playing like loud brass band stuff, like it's, it's a vibe for sure. And I'm not saying it's not ever appropriate, but for playing tunes, for me, not, not a thing I want to do. Um, I like jaw vibrato. I, I, I just kind of move the tongue sometimes, jaw. I, 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 just as kind of like I, 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 and so what I want to be able to do is go fast and slow. So I, I try to match somebody like JJ, and JJ would, JJ and Curtis too. You know, it's kind of like ba, it kind of goes faster and fades off at the end. That's kind of what I like to do. Mandy, you're welcome. She says thanks. DJ says thanks. You're welcome. Uh, if I find some other ones, DJ, I'll send you some other links to some more slide stuff. Um, so, David, I don't know. Does that answer your question? I think the timing is totally personal and you have to listen to it. You know, I would listen and transcribe um, great people to have vibrato. I, I mean, I just like how JJ and Curtis do it, especially on a, a ballad. Excuse me. You can really listen to it and it's really clear and it's not just like on and off. Right. It's like. It's measured, it's vocal. That's where it comes from. It comes from somebody like Nat King Cole, you know? Um, that's, where I, that's where I go for inspiration. I want it to sound like a vocalist. I want it to sound natural. I want it to sound musical and flowing. So there's no like exact formula for this, you know, for exact formula for a vibrato, at least in my experience. So stop doing slide vibrato. <laughs> I mean, you can do whatever you want, but uh, that's, that's what I would say, and more of that, um, Either whether you call it jaw, lip, I call it. Yeah, you use like syllables. You know, I yeah 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 yeah. It's kind of what I'm doing. Yeah 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 yeah. So the yeah kind of you can control the the. Yeah 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 yeah. It kind of builds tension, you know, because every single note needs life, and that's how we breathe the life into it. Sometimes with that vibrato, and if you've never thought about that deep when you're transcribing, it's actually super important to think about the how of the notes. Yeah, I can't tell you how many people I hear, especially in auditions and stuff, when they come in and one of the requirements for auditions at UNT is to play a transcription, just one chorus. Uh, it's like two choruses of blues or one chorus of a AABA. And it's like, yeah, those are the notes, but it sounds nothing like the person who played it. <laughs> you know, it's super important. Uh, David says he's classically trained. It's kind of different. I mean, I'm classically trained too. I mean, you listen to somebody who's great and the vibrato might be different for sure. And I know exactly what you mean. Like, but it's just, it comes from listening and matching. You heard how Joe Alessi did something and then you matched it, right? Or you tried to do it similarly. It's the same way with jazz. We listen to great soloists and then we mimic the how of the, how they're playing, you know, which is exactly what I'm saying. I'm talking about when I'm talking about the, the how of the transcription. That's the part that people miss, you know, it's the articulations, it's the vibrato, like we're talking about. It's the, tone color and the shifting of the tone color and it's the speed and the changing of the vibrato and even just being aware of it when you're listening makes you listen on a deeper deeper level but um i don't uh, i don't like this jazz versus classical thing like it's not a thing it's just trombone it's just music you play it one way or another way you know the tone might be slightly different the time and the articulation a little bit different the style a little different but it's all the same and for, I just, I, I want to get you out of that, David. Get get out of there. And uh, you'll be fine. Jazz is easy, I promise. It's only 12 notes. It's the same 12 notes. It's just about the, the feel of it. And the more you listen and the more you internalize, the more you uh, just listen deeply, you know, you're going to be, you're going to be good. I promise. All right. So let's see. Any other questions today? I appreciate everybody showing up, saying hello. Hello, I'm knocking things over. Saying hello and asking some questions. Uh, it's always great to interact with all of you. I hope you're having a, a good week despite uh, our circumstances. And uh, I think it might you know, be a while before we're able to be get together again. But um, I'm excited to keep on working. Um, just to remind people, Jazz Trombone Christmas happening on YouTube this month. If you aren't subscribed to the YouTube channel, head over there and subscribe to that one because uh, a lot of great information there, uh, or at least a lot of information. Uh, you can decide if it's great information or not, but a lot of information about jazz vocabulary and trombone playing. And then August 10th through 14th, mark it down, 
2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. Uh, every day that week, we're doing a deep dive into music marketing, branding, audience development, monetization, all this stuff. It's called uh, the Music Marketing Roadmap. You can go to musicmarketingroadmap.com if you want and sign up for the, the email list there to get the info. But uh, I'll be doing that. That's free as well. And we'll kind of do a deep dive into that stuff. I know a lot of students are interested. A lot of people don't know what to do when there's no gigs still. And it's been, at that point, it'll been five months of being in this uh, quarantine. So David said one thing. I will, alongside the many gifts of your dry Christmas. <laughs> David, well, I appreciate you checking everything out means a lot uh, i'm glad you could check it out glad it's useful it really it really means a lot so uh anyway music music marketing roadmap.com we'll see you there in august otherwise we'll see you back here on the live stream every friday 1 p.m eastern uh, 10 a.m pacific so we'll catch you guys uh in a week otherwise stay safe stay healthy and uh, we'll catch you next time